Everybody, please stand up. Announcing the arrival of Professor Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman, the Dean, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, who will chair this afternoon's lecture. And Professor Dr. Ern Chet Jen, Department of Primary Care Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Can we please stand for the national anthem and UN song? <laughs> Please be seated. Good afternoon, Professor Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman, Dean of Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Professor Dr. Tengku Kamaruzaman bin Tengku Zainal Abidin, Director, University of Malaya Medical Center. His Excellencies, Tansris, Datoks, Respected Professors, Distinguished Guests. Professor Dr. An Chetjen. Management of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. Ern Chet Jen entitled, Putting Patients Back to the Heart of Care. Without further delay, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman to chair the lecture and to introduce Professor Dr. Ern Chet Jen. Professor Adiba. Thank you, Dr. Adina. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to the first of the um, series of inaugural lectures for this year, 2016. And I can't think of anyone better to start the ball rolling for this year than um, Ng Che Chen. Um, I guess, I, you know, in reading your, your CV, um, 
perhaps Professor Ng Chek Jen could be best described as the one who almost got away. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, we have this rivalry with our twin or our cousin or our stepbrother, whatever you want to call NUS, um, because Chek Jen did his first degree at NUS and um, subsequently also stayed on to do masters in family medicine and fortunately for University Malaya chose to come back um, to Malaysia and to University Malaya. Not many of our um, graduates who, who go down south um, choose to do that and certainly I think um, the faculty and UM are so much richer and better for it because uh, Chuck Jen has been one of the um, shining stars in the faculty, uh, combining his uh, uh, clinical prowess with um, his certainly his um, academic achievements. I think uh, Chuck Jen has been one of the leading um, uh, academic staff uh, in in a small but very productive department of family medicine, they've probably got one of the highest uh, ratios of clinical clinicians to PhD uh, compared to many of the other um, clinical academic departments. So it certainly is a, um, uh, a tribute to the department, but also to Chuck Jen, who's been leading many of the uh, research uh, projects and programs in, in Department of Primary Care. Um, as uh, as an internist, as an internal medicine, I, I always admire people who choose to do primary care because really you are the consummate um, doctor. You have to know everything from from uh, from pediatrics all the way to terminal care. And and I, for one, who's never spent a day doing general practice, um, really really um, um, admire those who do. Uh, do primary care and, and Chuck Jen and colleagues are really leading um, the university as well as the primary care fraternity as a whole in trying to to build up the specialty of primary care. And I think at last count, um, we've put the task at you having to produce something like 20,000 primary care physicians for the country. No small task, but... Um, uh, with his background and uh, his, his contribution actively to the Academy of Family Physicians of Malaysia. I'm sure that uh, uh, Jen and, and colleagues um, eventually will be able to achieve these 20,000 uh, primary care physicians for the country. But I think where uh, Jen has really made his mark is in um, driving research uh, in, in primary care. And he has certainly established close collaboration with researchers from the UK, Australia, uh, and, and many parts of the world. And he was also tasked recently and has done an admirable job of uh, putting um, uh, hopefully blended learning, open uh, source learning for clinical research, uh, which we hope to, well, we, 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 we'll, we're trying it at the moment, but we hope to expand to the rest of the faculty and to those who are doing other uh, clinical master's program uh, for, for the requirement to complete a project. So he's been a busy man and, and on top of that he's now taken on the big task of uh, being the deputy chair of the ethics committee. So um, we, and, and I'm glad to see uh, the title of your talk, Putting Patients Back at the Heart of Care. I think it's very easy to lose sight of uh, what we do and who we are. And uh, I look forward to hearing how um, uh, Prof Ng's um, research into um, patient uh, decision making um, has uh, a will uh, lead us into better patient care. So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Adiba, for the kind introductions. Um, distinguished guests, friends, colleagues, family members, um, it's uh, an honor for me to be here 
speaking to all of you today. And um, I know many of you are having busy schedules and clinics and you have to cancel them to come to this lecture. I was just thinking, considering the man hours that we have here, the cost must be tremendous. <laughs> Right. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank um, many people here, or not here, who have um, made this possible for me. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee, uh, the ICR, um, the Dean's Office, the departments, particularly Puan Noor and Wen Ting, for putting this all together. I'd like to thank my teachers, both in all my years of schooling, uh, in NUS, as well as in UM, particularly Prof Chia, who is not here today. I um, also like to thank uh, my colleagues from the Department of Primary Care and from the other departments who have uh, helped me along the way, and um, as well as, of course, um, my students who have uh, kept me on my toes and keep going, and last but not least, my patients uh, who have uh, inspired me to talk about, to put up this title today, Putting Patients Back at the Heart of Care. Okay, let me start. As a primary care physician, um, I will attend my clinics quite regularly, but these days a, a bit less now, about once a week, used to be once every day. So, and I tend to hurry across to my room, consultation room. Actually, most of the time, don't looking at my patients, I just walk into my consultation room and get my patients' consultation started. Usually there's a long list and I have to rush them through. So. Sometimes I wonder what's happening to the patients outside my consultation room. Like this particular man, what is going through his mind? What has he thought about before he even come to see me in this clinic? Is he going to say, think that, am I going to see my regular doctors? I'm going to meet, he's not going to be around because he's attending meetings. I'm going to get my test results today. What's the results going to be? Okay. The doctor said that I'm supposed to start insulin this time if my blood sugar level is not good. So, but I don't want to because I have a lot of concerns. Or maybe I have lots of work waiting for me in my office and I just want to get through this as fast as I can. So many things goes through the mind, but how much do we know about what's going on in the mind of this particular patient? But this patient is not too bad, he's alone. I don't think he has to wait for too long to get his turn. More likely is this. Okay, this is, um, I think, A&E department. So long queues, and they will wait out, well, hopefully less now, right, under the guidance of Prof. Nuku Kamaro. And the waiting time is cutting shorter, but still, they have to wait a long time. But when they get in, the doctors probably stand, stand about 10 minutes, 15 minutes at most, and to see them. So are we really achieving what we set out to do is to help patients with their illness? This is a, if those of you have been to Ruka, Department of Primary Care Medicine, this is a typical consultation room. And there's my ex colleague, Dr. Tin, who is from Myanmar. And this is a nice Chinese lady, let's call her Madam Tan. Okay? Uh, obviously, uh, Dr. Tin uh, doesn't know how to speak Mandarin. Neither does um, Madam Tan know how to speak English. So most of the time, they will converse in Malay because Dr. Tin knows Malay. So, well, Madam Tan has lots of problems. She has diabetes on insulin. She has hypertension. She has dyslipidemia. She has osteoarthritis of the knee. She's slightly pale. She's a vegetarian, so a bit anemic. Um, and, of course, she has just, the husband just passed away. She's, dis, you know, just deceased, and she's coping with grieving. Lots of these problems that are typical patients that we see in primary care, really. So, Dr. Tin, has to deal with all these things. So the patient typically spends 15 minutes with us, at most 20 minutes per consultation. So each, each year they see us for four, four times a year. So that is about an hour a year. What happened to them the rest of the year? 264 days and 23 hours. How much do we know their life beyond the consultation? And every day, Madam Tan has to grapple with, and that's just the health, just the diabetes, about her diet, about monitoring her sugar, about remembering to take her tablets, her medications, 
and injections at night, once a day. So, but this is just part of a life. This is just the health part of a life. How about the rest of a life, the social part of a life? We don't know. Her children, her grandchildren, she has to look after. The grieving, now losing her husband. So, how much do we know about our patient, really? And when we try to manage our patients, all this comes into play because all this affects her, her life, including her health. This is a paper that uh, went in date for her master's and uh, Dr. Sharini and myself co-authored. Why do some people with type 2 diabetes who are already on insulin still have poor glycemic control? It's an exploratory qualitative study. And these are my attempt to try to show you some of the voices of patients, their needs, what's happening in their life at home. This is uh, an ex-lorry driver. He was a lorry driver until he had to start on insulin and he kept having hypos and then he has to stop driving. Every time, he spoke in Cantonese actually, every time the doctor asked me to eat bread, can you eat bread every day? For sure you will hate it. They will ask you to eat vegetables every day. Cannot like that, you know. As much as, as doctors, part of uh, the things that we do is to advise patients about our diet. And, but to the patients, you know, diet is just part of their life and they enjoy eating. So you're asking them to eat bread, you know, go on cereals, milk and all that. It just doesn't work. Do we know what they're doing at home? This 40-year-old uh, officer, government officer, I don't quite like insulin, actually. I'm very afraid of needles and the pain that follows. In a week, I would say at least three times, I would skip the insulin injections. These are interviews from patients, and that's no wonder the sugar is high. But we can't solve their hyperglycemia, the high sugar, unless we deal with the root of the problem, that he's afraid of the needles and it's painful. This is another paper that we published uh, with Wun Mei and, and uh, Prof Chua, Barriers and Facilitators to Self-Monitoring of Blood Sugar in people with type 2 diabetes, and these are the voices, of this 61-year-old retired teacher living with diabetes for 20 years. If the blood sugar reading is a bit, let's say, one or two unit higher, I get frustrated. Why is the blood sugar not coming down? That's frustration. I pray 100 times. I pray, pray, pray that it must not be more than that before they did the blood sugar monitoring. Then I prick. And see, oh, it is more than what's expected. Before diabetes kills me, the mental torture will kill me. And that's why I just couldn't be bothered to check my blood sugar at all. So this is exactly what's happening in the real world. Despite the fact that we say, you must monitor your sugar, it's very important. Then you can gauge, then you can adjust your insulin, blah, blah, blah. But that's exactly what's happening in the mind. Unless and until we address that, the high blood sugar level will not be soft. And let's go back to this lady again, and poor Dr. Thin has to deal with all these things. Her sugar is high, that's because she's not monitoring, she's skipping her injections you know, three times a day, and um, she just cannot control her food because she just enjoys food. Eating bread, vegetables, no go. So how is Dr. Thin going to help her? Should we... Because for us, as medical doctors, we are trained to use evidence base to try to help this person. Try to use the best available evidence based on scientific research. And scientific research said that diet is important, medication is important, insulin is the way to go. But this patient is telling you that that's not the most important thing to her. I started off as a, a junior house officer um, in Singapore General Hospital, attended my first um, evidence-based medicine workshop. And I was really happy because finally I, I see the light because I feel that that's probably the best way I can, uh, the, the method I can use to try to manage my patients because I was just looking at the scientific evidence. For those of you who are not familiar with evidence-based medicine, it basically means that you try to integrate whatever scientific research together considering your experience, your familiarity with the patients, and then take into consideration patients' values, what is important to them, and then practice as such. But most of the time, previously, people just focus on the scientific evidence without actually looking into the patient values. So when I was happy seeing that because it's black and white, 
There's evidence, I practice it. No evidence, I don't practice it. It's so easy for me, especially for junior doctors. That's why we stick strictly to clinical practice guidelines as if they are the Bible, but little do we know that these guidelines are just guidelines. They are not black or white. There's a lot of gray in between. This is, sorry for the confusing map, and if you think about it, if evidence-based medicine is practiced by the doctors worldwide, and this is embraced as the way we should practice medicine, are we doing, we should see that those patients who require some treatment should be receiving it. But just look at this map, I'm using the US data. Hopefully one day Malaysia will have the same kind of data. It's a Dartmouth Atlas project, some of you may be aware. It basically map out the practices across the whole uh, United States and try to see whether there's variations in how doctors practice medicine. The darker, the, red, the redder it is, means that the more mastectomy is being done for women with breast cancer. As you know, mastectomy for early breast cancer, you can either do mastectomy, which means you remove the whole breast, or you can do lumpectomy, which you just removed um, a, a small part of the breast with radiotherapy. So, and you can see that the yellow means that it is very, it's not so commonly practiced, whereas red means very um, commonly practiced. And you can see the variations, even, even if you look at it, even Chicago, just within Chicago itself, the second one, you could see there are yellow, there's red, and there's dark red. That means even within that small little area, there's variations in how doctors decide whether to do mastectomy or not. It's not because the fact that the women are different because some are early, some are late, it's not. And also not because patients uh, don't want to do mastectomy. Well, maybe a portion of them, but majority actually leave it to the doctors. And the doctors basically make the decision. This is just mastectomy which means that the decision is made based on the doctor's discretion. And the doctors know for the fact that if you think about it, if mastectomy and lumpectomy are equally effective in treating cancer, that should be equal. There should not be so much. So but in this case, there's overwhelmingly a lot of mastectomy in one area versus the other. So I think this is something for us to really think about. And why are we practicing differently if evidence-based medicine should guide us? Um, Ronita, uh, Prof Liu, myself, Rene, did a study looking at GPs' views and experiences about practicing evidence-based medicine. And these are the conclusions just been accepted for publication. The GP said that they lacked knowledge and skills, and it really depends on the workplace culture, whether the workplace promote this kind of evidence-based medicine culture or not. It's more in academic institutions like in UMMC, but when you go to private GPs in Clinic of Sehatan, then the skills and the culture are completely different and they, don't, they practice evidence-based medicine less. It tends to depend on more experts' opinion. The shocking thing we found was that EBM perceived as a threat to good clinical practice. When we, I look at it, I was like, why, why, why is they think, are they thinking that EBM should be perceived as a threat? And the reason is because, this is from a GP, he feels that evidence-based medicine people tend to focus on research, scientific evidence, and neglecting what the patients think. If we want to be embracing patient-centered care, then we should be thinking about patients rather than just using the scientific evidence. But actually, in real, in real, in actual definition of evidence medicine, patient values are actually important. It's how we practice it. But this is what people perceive evidence-based medicine as. So going back to the topic of today is about patient-centered care. When we practice evidence-based medicine, I think we tend to neglect patient values, which is an important part. And if ultimately whatever outcome of the treatment is, patients are the ones who are going to benefit or to suffer or get the harm. So I think when we practice so-called evidence-based medicine, we really have to look at patient values, which are what's important to the patient, what are their preferences, what's important to them. 
this is a study that's conducted by um, Dr. Lee Yu Kong, uh, my first PhD student, who is now a senior lecturer in our department. He explored what patient values means in the medical decision-making concept. And when we look at patient values, it's not just talking about the treatment-specific values. For example, we talk about diabetes. We're not just talking about is um, avoiding complications important? Is uh, hypos something that I would consider as important to me? But we also have to think about the life goals and life philosophies because a busy person who is in the you know, in the early stage of their career, career, their family, money is much more important than health. They will sacrifice health for that. So when we explore patient values, I think it's very important to take into consideration their life goals, what's important at that stage of life. And of course, the last circle is actually personal and social cultural background. Sometimes the religion takes precedence over it. If they suspect that the insulin is not halal, for example, they will not take it. So I think this is a broader context of how we should see patient values, not just about the treatment, but also their life goals and their social and cultural background. This is just an example I showed you. That, For example, starting insulin type 2 diabetes, we have patient values which are, I'm afraid of the pain, it's, not, it's expensive, I may faint, because they look at many movies. When you start insulin, you may have hypo, you may faint. Will I get more complications? They think that by starting insulin, they get, can, can get, get kidney failure, for example. Whereas for the doctors sitting on the other side of the table, they're well, more worried about the blood sugar control. We're worried about are we achieving our audit targets of HbA1c of less than 6.5%, because that's what our boss wants us to do. Fewer complications. So you can see a mismatch between the two, the patient values and the doctor's values. And we know that they are not the same. So there's a clash there. So when there's a clash, you can see that the consultation will not go well. And this is the reason why I think before I went for my PhD, I was pretty frustrated because I was trying here to help you, the patients, to convert to con insulin because I want you to save your limbs, save your eyesight, and prevent you from getting heart attack. But the patient is saying no, no, no. And then one year later, they're still not on insulin. So I feel really frustrated. <laughs> but only when I discovered that actually there's this mismatch that we need to deal with, then I can live with that. So acting in the best of interest of patients may not hold true all the time. I think we need to listen to the patients more. And the Institute of Medicine, now it's called the National Academy of Medicine, defined patient-centered care as providing care that's respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. And I really like this definition. But this is not saying that we don't need to have competent clinicians. We must, and that's a prerequisite. But that's not enough. We need to take patients' values and needs into our considerations when making clinical decisions with them. And how to operationalize this? I mean, this sounds very soft, very nice, very philosophical. Can you actually convert it into something concrete, something interventional, something that we can actually practice in our daily clinical consultations? No point talking about it if you can't do anything about it. This is a concept of shared decision making, which is introduced by Kathy Charles in McMaster, Canada. And on the one hand is the paternalistic model, which is something that um, medicine is quite used to. That means the doctors, being the expert, knows what is best and then decide for the patients what is the treatment option. On the other hand is the other extreme, is whereby doctors provide the information, give the patients the information, and the patients just make the decisions without actually needing to ask the doctors what his or her opinions is, which is not usually happens in, in our context. But shared decision making is in between, whereby patient provides information about their values and preferences, practitioners provide their clinical expertise based on scientific evidence and their clinical experience, and both parties discuss, negotiate, and agree on that decision. This sounds very ideal, and it can be anything in between. It's not three concrete blocks, but 
somewhere in between also happens. So, but it's with this that interventions are being developed to help patients make informed decisions. So if you look at Madam Tan and Dr. Thin, on one hand is the expert patients who knows about their values, their health beliefs, their health knowledge, and psychosocial background. These days and age, internet is very easily accessible. Patients will search for information before they go into the consultation room, perhaps not Madam Tan, but some of the younger generations. They will definitely search before they go in and ask you the questions. Also, on the other hand, of course, are the clinicians with the clinical expertise as well as having the experience of managing patients and knowing these patients' health status throughout because they're following up them up across. So they know these patients' sort of preferences. And they also know the health resources, where to refer the patients, where the cheaper drugs, you know, and all this. And through this, in the consultations, together with other family members, as well as the nurses, the dietitians, the podiatrists, the pharmacists, that they come to a decision. As you can see, it's actually very complex. That is a journey that we go through. But truly, I mean, do patients want to be involved in decision making? Isn't it easier if doctors make the decision? After all, the doctors should be in the positions to advise the patients. So this is a study conducted by Angela Coulter in 2005, but I think it still holds true until now, that there's wide variations in different countries whether the patients, people actually, wanted to make their own decisions or wanted the doctors to share decisions with them. And this is whereby they want to make their own decisions or the doctors share with them rather than doctors making for them. You see in Switzerland, Germany, UK, very high, particularly Switzerland. And in Poland and Spain, much less. In Spain, less than 50%. They want the doctors to make the decision for them. So, so I was quite excited when I came back from my PhD in 2009, wanting to share this concept of shared decision making. So I presented it in the hospital conference and attended by quite a few people and about, we should do this, shared decision making. And that's when uh, I got a question, actually it's from Prof Sanjeev actually, who raised this question, Chuk Jen, this sounds all very nice, very Western, you know, but does it work, actually? Our patients, most of the time, may want us to guide them in making the decision, or even want us to make the decision, which is still true, I think, in many ways. So I was really upset with Sanjeev because I said, what? How could you say that? But when I went back and reflect, I said, it's true. And this is, I mean, the previous slide just showed that, isn't it? So I, I asked myself, you know, I said, ah, this, you know, hospital-based clinicians, you know, they don't, you know, but maybe he has a point there. So I actually went back and seriously think about it, and then I decided to do this study. And then Ranjini, who has now graduated, now the family physicians in uh, Penang, did this study when she was uh, a master's student in 2012, actually. Patient involvement in decision-making, a cross-section study in Malaysian primary care clinic. But bear in mind, this is primary care clinic. This is not in the ward. This is not in clinical sehatan, okay? And this is what we found. More than 70%, okay, this is compared to Japan, but if you just look at Malaysia, 50 plus 20, about almost three-quarter want to be involved in decision-making. This is all the walk-in patients in Gruka, including those with chronic diseases. Only about 25% want the, the doctor to make decisions for them. So I got the answer, all right? And then we also found that the only thing that's associated with their preference is actually their household income. It means that those who are poorer tends to want the doctors to make decisions for them because they do not perhaps have much options. And this is the only place they can come to because it's cheaper, for example. And we also found that we asked the doctor to predict whether they can guess what the, doc the patient wants. Do they want a more autonomous role or something? They want the doctors to predict whether, you know, whether they, they want the doctors to make decisions for them. We found that the doctors failed terribly when they asked them to try to predict whether the patients want to be involved or not. So, which means that we are not very good, we meaning the doctors and the healthcare professionals are not very good actually in understanding what patients want. So I think this really is also a wake-up call, but 
we just completed another study, but this time in a rural setting. Unfortunately, it's just um, we just analyzed the data, and it was done in uh, Kuala Langat, somewhere near Banting, but in a rural setting. And we found actually the opposite, meaning that 75% of them want the doctor to make decisions for them. Okay, I, I need to be balanced. Otherwise, I'll be just telling you the positive findings, right? <laughs> and then... Um, the other quarter actually did not want the doc the, only a quarter wanted the doc them to be involved in uh, decisions making themselves. So there is a variation. So, but we don't know who are the ones who want and who are the ones who don't want. So I think more needs to be done on this. And then we went on a group of us who are really interested in shared decision making, came together and then did what we call a situation analysis, a scoping review, whereby we wanted to know what's happening in Malaysia. So we published this paper, an overview of patient involvement in healthcare decision making. We looked at the clinical practice, the teaching in undergrads and postgraduate. We looked at the um, uh, research done in this area. We looked at the policies, we looked at the laws and legislations. Very little done. And very little in the curriculum is about decision-making, patient-centered care. It's all subsumed under communication skills, consultation skills. It's all in the hidden agenda, uh, curriculum. It's not explicitly sort of tested as such. So there's a gap. There's a gap. There is actually a sort of a policy of sort that's uh, already published by MMC saying that we must involve patients in decision making and it's quite explicitly laid out but that was already about 15 20 years ago and it's still not being implemented until now so what's happening and let's go back again so with all this with the gaps and all that so how are we going to help Madam Tan in this consultation can we do something about it, or are we going to just leave with it? And there are actually different ways of helping patients to make decisions. I'm sure some of us have made difficult decisions in our lives, not necessarily health, but in terms of health decisions, these are the three ways that people have actually done research on and found to have some evidence. First is patient decision aids, which I'll tell you more about it. Second is decision coaching, whereby the healthcare professionals or counsellor teach people how to make decisions. Third is actually training the healthcare professionals in communication skills, consultation skills, so that they engage patients in decision making. Which one do you think is the most effective? I wish it's the third, but actually this is the one with the least evidence. Okay, and it's been found to be actually not so effective. Decision coaching, some evidence. The one with the most evidence is actually the patient decision aids, which actually is what I've been doing for the past, I would say, seven to eight years. I started with my PhD, didn't know what our patient decisions aid all about. It's only through literature review I discovered that. And there was an early phase of this patient decision aids research. And then now I'm doing a bit more. And you may ask what patient decision aids are. It's basically an evidence-based tool. That means it's based on scientific evidence. And it tells patients about the risks and benefits of the treatment. For example, the risks and benefits of mastectomy versus lumpectomy, insulin versus no insulin, questions to explore what's important to patients, something that we don't usually ask in or explore in education pamphlets, for example. It facilitates the doctors or the nurses in the consultations, but not replacing them. And it should not by right influence one person to choose one option over another. Because most of the time as clinicians, we tend to influence the patients to choose one option over another. So if we are truly patient-centered, then we should actually leave it to them to sort of make their decisions without undue influence. And this is a clustered randomized controlled study that I've done in UK involving about 150 patients, about 33 practices in the general practices. And we've tried to find out whether a patient decision aids that's helping patients to make decisions about insulin, starting insulin, helps them to make a better decisions or improve their blood sugar level. And it's been found through this cluster randomized controlled trial that it improved patients' knowledge, how they perceive risks of getting a particular complications, involving, they improve the involvement in decision-making, and also reduces the conflict 
whether to make these decisions or that decisions. But there's no difference in terms of their blood sugar level because some people may say if you let them make the decisions, then they won't start insulin, in which case their sugar level may actually go up. But actually, we found there's no difference. And the consultation time, again, people may worry that by doing this engaging, talking to them, you actually prolong the consultation time by using these decision aids, but actually there's no difference as well in terms of consultation time. So decision roles wise actually, how did you make your decisions about your diabetes treatment? As you can see, the treatment group, the, those with patient decision aids, are more involved in decision making, whereas those who are in the control group, 21% of them still getting sort of decision made by the healthcare professionals. So there is an impact in terms of um, the decision role after using the decision aids with the p-values of less than 0.05. Same thing for those who have made their decisions, how many of them actually persist with their decisions? We know that sometimes patients say, yes, I'll start insulin, but at the end, after six months, they stop using it because they got all the side effects, complications, because the decision is not an informed one. Again, you can see that those who are using patient decision aids actually persist. 68% of them persisted with their decisions, whereas 56% of those in the control persisted. Okay, that is a statistically significant difference between the two. But of course, decision aid is not the cure to everything. It's not the answer to everything. It has its limitations as well, as we have written in this uh, the letter to BMJ. That, however, use of these aids is only one component of transformation and change needed to promote and embed patient centered care into usual clinical practice. We cannot replace a sort of patient centered care with just using like decision aids, and that's it. It requires the change of the health system, the change of the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare professionals' attitudes towards patients. These aids are not aimed at just saving treatment costs, but can also help change the relationship between clinicians and patients, particularly in the management of long-term conditions. The routine use of patient decision aids are part of whole system change, can also facilitate the introductions of other patient-centered care, care initiatives such as shared decision-making, support for self-management, and care planning. And this led me to the projects that I've been doing for the past seven to eight years. We call it the DIMIT project, or the Decision Making on Insulin Therapy, whereby we try to develop decision aids to support patients in decision making. As you can see, this is now this is a website actually, and it's now DIMIT three. It was one, two, and then now three. So um, now this is at the implementation phase. At the first was the development phase, the second was actually at the developing in the health innovations, and the third phase now is the implementation phase. And this decision aids was developed based on a specific framework. Whenever we do uh, develop an intervention, I think it's very important to keep in mind that this intervention is not because we like it, it's useful, but because it must be developed based on the needs of the stakeholders. So we actually interview patients doctors, nurses, pharmacists, policy makers in the process of developing this decision aid. And something that I learned is that you must, we must, we must involve the patients in research, in telling us what is important, what is needed in research at the early phase. They don't come in as a participant of your research, but come in as the development of your research. And be more and more we are doing that, and nowadays I think most of the projects would have a patient involved when we develop an intervention. And we find it very useful. We need to train them. And I think uh, one of my patients, actually, I think Mr. Chong, you know, uh, my, my patient who has very good, give us a lot of feedback about some of the interventions we have done, and we really thank him for that. And from this, we published quite a few papers and I'm going to show you some of the lessons we have learned from this. And one of the key things that is different from the other decision aids developed in other countries, I'm going to summarize it for you, actually is the cultural difference. When we develop a decision aid, when we try to develop something that is something, import something from the Western world, I think we have to be very careful. 
we should not just import it and implement it. And this we learned also from this particular study. I'm going to share with you some of the things that we must consider when we uh, sort of um, develop an intervention, particularly for patient-centered interventions. Language barrier. I think you all know this very well. Language barriers were common, especially when healthcare professionals did not know the patient's preferred language. This particular Malay man in Clean Kasatan said, Tapi bahasa English saya tak faham. Saya faham sikit-sikit, bahasa Melayu mungkin boleh faham. Fortunately, most of our patients, our doctors and nurses can speak Malay. Right? My Malay is not very good, so sometimes I struggled. But, um, but it's very important to speak the lingua. Same goes for dialect speaking, Mandarin speaking, or Tamil speaking patients. All this decision making is very difficult if you don't speak their language. A doctor said, a medical officer in Clean Kassan said, language I feel is very important barrier you have to overcome. I managed to get lots of Indian staff to be in the clinic, so basically when we improve the communication, the patient can accept it better. So they already implemented it by getting more healthcare professionals of that particular ethnic groups. So for that, we actually developed the decision aids in four languages. So we struggled with Tamil, but we did it eventually. It's a struggle. And we also developed healthcare professional guides for them. The other issue is this paternalistic healthcare model that is very commonly practiced. There were concerns that patient decision aids was developed with a hidden agenda to persuade patients to start insulin. This is a tool. Whenever a doctor gives a patient a tool, the patients automatically will think that, oh, you want me to start insulin? You're giving this tool? You must be trying to persuade me to start something. But actually, it's not the case. For example, this university-based primary care doctor said, they find that this is a tool for us to persuade them to take insulin. I think she perceived it that way rather than for them to see which treatment is good or which is bad. And for this particular patients in, well, in UMMC, at the rate they're going, that means the doctors are going, they have so many patients, I have overheard them saying, today alone 250 patients. Actually, we are more likely to get 500 to 600. <laughs> you know, all this take time is a good deal idea, but how are you going to see it through is another thing. And the doctor must be committed to want it, or do they feel like it is a waste of time? And this is exactly what we found, I think, when we interviewed doctors. They think it's a good idea, but can we implement it in a busy clinic setting, clinical setting? Well, for that, we have to train. Sorry, it's a bit dark, and that's me and the training. We have a workshops, we have a guidebook, and now we have an e-learning module that they can go online and learn. Because as you know, workshops is uh, not sustainable, and you want to disseminate why we can't be conducting workshops all the time. So I think we're thinking of ways to how to implement this, the teaching and training the trainers. Use of complementary and alternative medicine, all the herbs, or the jamu, you know, or the Chinese medicine, keep coming up again and again. And we know some of us are also thinking ourselves. This Malay taxi driver, after seeing Dr. X, I was feeling the tension, meaning that she has to start the insulin, right? I was approached by this salesperson just below the clinic, right? He gave me this 44 types of vitamin, like ice blended kind of thing. I don't know, I just drank it. And he's a taxi driver, and for one year, he has been drinking days Every day, it's almost like, like TB patients coming back for their drugs or something like that, dots or something. And it's effective. You know why? He lost weight. By drinking this, the salesperson also said, you, if you drink this, you cannot take a lot of meat. You have to cut down your rice. You have to eat healthy. Only this juice will work. Of course it worked because... He lost 10 kilos. He was obese and now he's 10 kilos. So of course it worked. And, but he could not, he didn't continue on because it's expensive and he has to drive there every day and do it. So, but this is what happens. Perhaps that might, be, might work. In fact, it's not the juice, as you know. It's the advice that goes with it and which we have been telling the patients. It's the perceptions of the patients about the drugs we're giving them. I think. And I think it's only if you engage them, find out their concerns, their needs, then we can address this problem. Then our interventions will be effective. Then the sugar will be controlled. This private GP said, and when you tell them your diabetes has come to a stage where you need injections, they will say they have these herbs and so on. They want to try the herbs first. So for that, 
we put that options in. As you can imagine, the struggle I had when I tried to put this into the guide. We have a lot of resistance from the clinicians. They say, how can you put complementary and alternative medicine as an option for the top patients to choose? We don't believe it. It's not, that's not evidence-based medicine. But that's an option for the patient. If you truly are thinking about patient, this is an option for the patient. So why can't we put this in and then discuss it at our normal consultation? If you don't put it in, patients will not tell you they're taking it. If you put it in, then patients say, oh, you actually realize this is an option, then I'll tell you that actually this is an option. Then we can have a discussions about it. Okay. The next one is family involvement. I think we know that Asian culture, family is very important. When I said that to my Western colleagues, I think they, they are usually, they say, no, family members are also very important to us, but maybe to a different degree as how much we are going to help is sort of involved in the care for our family members. This is a very interesting exploration of not just family involvement, but also patients' values. Look at the first level. Okay, this patient believes that insulin is expensive. Yeah, I feel I want to save money. My insulin exp is expensive. I don't want to take it. Just want to take one fluid, one tablet. Okay, this patient is a 55-year-old female. Uh, sorry, 66-year-old uh, female. And when you probe a little bit more about their life goals and philosophies, I'm mostly thinking about work. Lah. My son-in-law, children, how much money can they give? My daughter has her own family. My son also has his own family. So his priority is his children, his family, not his health. And we look even at a broader circle about background. Patient had to support family after the loss of husband's job. I suffer a lot one. Well, slang. My husband retired at 55 because the doctor asked him to stop working. That time, he has heart problem. That's why every cent I earned, give it to my son and daughter to study. That's why every cent is so important to, him, to her. And that's why he feels that it's very difficult for the children to earn money, so he doesn't want to disturb them. That's why he feels that insulin is expensive, though she can afford it, but he just doesn't want to spend the money. He doesn't want to ask for money from the children. So when we talk about this, you know, if we want to discuss insulin with this lady, you, you cannot just tackle herself. You have to involve the family as well. Maybe talk to the children, find out more about it, get them to talk about it. Otherwise, we can't solve the problem. And for that, we put this into the decision aid, what's important to you, and then that my family may not agree with me starting insulin, or at least this is a thing that they talk about, about the family. So we want them to tell us about it. And the last point is, is insulin halal? This came out in our interview as well whereby the purity of insulin injections was some of the concerns for the Muslim Hindus. This is particularly true in the more the rural setting because we interviewed patients from the rural setting as well. There were also concerns about injections during the fasting month for Muslims. How can we inject ourselves during fasting month? Because that would mean that you're not fasting. If you cannot fast, you pay fine. That's his perceptions. I think they were thinking about insulin is from non-halal products. Okay. So these are some of the concerns we have that we have when we develop a patient-centered tools, we have to take all this into consideration. And for that, we actually put in this checkbox there for them to take whether insulin is halal or not. So that's just the insulin patient decision aids. That's just one of the options we can use to help us to implement shared decision making, putting patients in the center of care. There are other decision aids since then that have been developed. Uh, Julia is here, uh, Prof. Julia. Uh, she has developed one fantastic tool on Bladder Explorer, which helps patients with spinal cord injury who are making decisions about the bladder drainage methods. Which one to use? Should they use indwelling catheter? Should they have an operations you know, to have an uh, uh, inside to catheter? Should they just go on diapers without having any catheters? These are the options. And these are those who struggled to use, so she has developed an iPad version of the decision aid to help them. And of course, uh, Aisha is not here, Prof. Aisha. Together, we have sort of built this uh, decision aid to help women to, uh, with early breast cancer to make decisions about whether to choose mastectomy or lumpectomy plus radiotherapy. So what are the options available? And this has also been um, developed into a, a mobile phone app. And last but not least is uh, prostate cancer decision aids, which I have the honor of developing it together with uh, Prof. Li Pingin from UPM and the team. 
and trying to develop, we have already developed this uh, for patients with men with prostate cancer, helping them to make decisions. As you know, early prostate cancer, there are lots of options available. So all these are fine, but can it be implemented? Otherwise, it's just on the shelves of the researchers. Okay, Very nice to show, but not being used. Um, how do we implement it? We are still in the process of trying to find ways to do that. And in fact, that's DEMIT3 is trying to do that. But one way of doing it is to actually update our decision aids. You saw the first versions. Actually, we ran out of it because we printed about 100,000 over. It's ran out, so we have to print the next one. And during the second versions, we update the information, change the layout based on the patient's um, feedback. And we also develop a website for those who have no access to the book. They can at least go to this interactive website and then to actually do this. Some of the patient's family actually wanted to look at decision aid. So if they didn't come with the patients, if they don't have decision aids, at least they can go to the websites and find out. And there's also an iPad applications they can use if they want to. And we also developed an online healthcare professional training modules, um, which was parked under UMMC um, website, but I think now there's some restructuring, so I think we need to put it back again to guide the healthcare professionals on how to start uh, to use the patient decision aids. We also have a booklet form. All these are available freely online at the website. Yeah. So with that, actually, then we actually try to use it. And at the moment in the Ruka clinic, in a few of the clinical satans, people are using it. And now we're trying to do a study to find out whether it's sustainable, what kind of strategies work best to how to implement it so that people will use it not just short-term during the, uh, the research period, but long-term and incorporated into um, the routine care. So that's the story about the decision aids and shared decision-making and one, way, one of the many ways to put patients in the center of our care. Next, the, four, the next 10 minutes or so, I would just like to share a little bit of my other interest, which is on men's health. <laughs> Okay. Some of you might know me as more like a men's health person rather than shared decision-making person because recently we have conducted the Moustache for Men campaign in UMMC with a strong support from um, the UMMC management. So this is the Men's Health Initiative, um, Moustache. I actually grew Moustache for a month, actually. <laughs> but somebody said they didn't notice the difference, actually. So, <laughs> so well, hmm, I'll try again this year. Um, so we had this poster exhibitions and all that. The reason why I bring this up, why is this, what does it have to do with patient-centered care, really? Or because I feel that the next level, besides at the clinical level, is actually reaching out to the community, to people out in the community who maybe do not even come to the hospital or the clinic. And if we really put people in the center of care, then we should reach out to them. We should go to where they are. And this is where I find uh, the opportunity to work with um, uh, Sylvia and Adnan in a project in Hospice Malaysia, whereby they, their patients are all, most of them are out in the community. Is when you go there and visit them, then you realize the issues that they have. Then we truly can occupy that blank space of 364 days <laughs> and 23 hours. Because that's there, that's where they're living. Even then, we only see a snapshot view of that. My involvement with the Suchi Foundations also helped me to do some home visits, to see people out in the community, which also guided me to think that, yes, truly, if you really want to understand them, the best way is to just go to them. And this is what we did. These are posters, well designed by Chin Hai and the team, and take a moustache and pass it on. So, things like that. And during that campaign, we screened about 200 over people, men, men, and we diagnosed, well, we screened and then found that many of them actually have depression that has never been diagnosed. And we used the score to, to, to sort of assess it, and we found that they are all, many of them are severe depression. And they could not just hold back and just tell us about their problems. And 
we are so glad. I mean, those people who are there, the doctors who are there, I think they find very grateful because they find that they really make a difference because these are people who are on the verge of really collapse in terms of their mental health. So I think it's something I find that is something we should do more, the campaign and open up to people and telling them where to seek help. And this is a photo. I was trying to look for photos for my other projects. I found that I had very few photos. But this is one of the things. Why I put this up is because I think the thing, next thing we should move to sort of push patient-centered care to the next level, in this case, men's health, is that we need to involve different stakeholders. In this case, we have Dr. Kamalia, who is from the Ministry of Health. She's the deputy Pungara of the Family Health Division who I met yesterday because we are now going on to try to develop a policy for men's health. And we have uh, external um, speakers or ex-professors men's health from Leeds, uh, Prof. Ellen White. And of course, we have Dato, who is a champion of men's health in Malaysia, who is from NGOs, from the private sector. We have Prof. Tay, who is from, who is an economy, uh, demographer. We have Prof. Shaifu from um, USM, Prof. Ong from our, of course, Sharina, my boss. Um, Tong from UKM and Zakia from U MOH and uh, Prof Ng from SPM, Health Economist. Oh, I'm showing you this is because I think for things to work, you need a, a whole team and you need to involve many people from dis different disciplines, different institutions. And what's missing here is actually a patient. Okay? But, but we have many men here and at some stage of our lives, we are all patients. Okay? And of course, Chin Ha is um, the PhD student who is working on this project. So it's through this, you know, we have different stakeholders that we come together and um, try to champion a particular cause, in this case, men's health. And of course, there's a website, some advertisements there. We also produce an Asian Men's Health Report, which is now widely circulated. It's the first in Asia, and I have the honor of doing it together with Prof Tan, as well as Chris Ho from UKM and Shin Hai as well. And we went on to publish this, which have received a lot of feedback about status of men's health in Asia. And we also did a Delphi survey where we surveyed the key stakeholders across the world about their views about how we should move men's health forward. So currently, we're trying to develop a men's health index, which is trying to measure the men's health uh, status in each country so that policymakers then can assess the men's health status in each country and compare with another country so that they can gauge where they are. And through this, the policy perhaps can be shaped and changed, and men's health in this case can be improved uh, over time. So this last bit of my lecture actually is more about trying to move things perhaps at a higher level. Perhaps in the next 10 years of my life, I will try to move a little bit more in shared decision making and try to push this across. But I know Ministry of Health is already thinking about that and short patient-centered care, shared decision making. So I hope I could join in and provide more evidence and do more interventions to try to put patients back in the heart of care. And this, back to Madam Tan again, I think no matter whether you are medical students, whether you are a nurse, a pharmacist, um, a doctor, a professor, a hospital administrator, a policy maker. I think we need to really listen to Madam Tan and what she has to say. What her needs are, responds to her needs, address her concerns, knows about her, knows about her life, knows about the 364 days and 23 hours that she lived with besides health, only then can we put patients back to the heart of care. With that, I thank you. I would like to call upon Professor Dr. Adiba Kamuzaman to conclude the lecture which has been delivered by Professor Dr. Anchet Jen a moment ago. Thank you, Chuk Jen. You didn't disappoint us. Mm -hmm. uh, taking the first inaugural lecture for 2016, and I think um, everyone in the audience, I'm sure, would agree with me that um, 
you've made us proud in the sense that uh, you're the consummate doctor, consummate researcher, and also, um, you know, th th that you, it, it came through very clearly that whatever you do, that the patient is at the center of, of, your, of your concern, and that you have beautifully married your um, academic uh, prowess to answer the very, very many um, barriers and, and questions that, um, that, that we all face. But instead of just throwing up your hands, as I do when I do ward rounds and I see someone's sugar is, is, is not uh, optimum, but you have really beautifully, systematically tried to understand um, what goes on at the bottom of this. But not only have you um, done it in, you know, in, in a research-oriented um, manner in trying to understand the, the complexities, particularly of, of our patients here in Malaysia, where you know, religion and family and everything else comes into play, and you didn't stop there, but you've also um, utilized your, your research um, and analytical background to then try and solve these problems through your uh, through the decision um, patient, what is it called? The AIDS. <laughs> the patient AIDS. And, and finally, um, you know, in terms of your contribution to men's health, uh, as you said, you're taking it to the next level. It is not just, you know, for, for most people, you would think uh, primary care physicians concern about that one-on-one -on -one, um, patient interaction that you all are uh, very good at, but you've now taken it to the next level in terms of the preventative and, and the public health um, aspects of, of healthcare. And uh, with that, I think it only leaves me to congratulate you, and um, we're very pleased that um, you decided to return to Malaysia and, and made such a huge contribution. Um, now your next task is to try and convince those who are still in Singapore to come back and uh, <laughs> and show that, you know, uh, we can be as good as them and we can contribute to not just uh, Malaysian healthcare, but, but to regional and, and, and global healthcare as well. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Adiva, for chairing this lecture. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the management of the Faculty of Medicine, International Corporate Relations Office, citizens of University of Malaya, as well as all the guests who came here for your time. With this, uh, we have reached the end of the lecture. On behalf of the University of Malaya, I would like to apologize if there have been any weaknesses from our side in organizing this lecture. Also, as a token of appreciation, um, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Nick Sharina uh, Hanafi, uh, which is our, the head of department uh, for primary care medicine, uh, to give uh, Professor Ng um, a bouquet of flower um, as a token of uh, appreciation and a congratulation note. I would also like to invite uh, Ms. Ranita, uh, who represents Professor Ng's uh, students, uh, to also give him another bouquet of flowers <laughs> as a token of appreciation. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, may I invite you all to a light refreshments that will be served just above this auditorium uh, at level four. Uh, and we would greatly um, like to see you there. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, thank you and have a pleasant evening. Thank you very much.